y'all, what's up? Welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. My name is Jess, and today I'm going to give you the first farm tour that I will ever shoot on this property. Definitely not the last. I guess technically this is more of a pre-farm tour because today I'm gonna share with you the plan that we are putting in place for this property. If you haven't been tracking with us, I'll go ahead and give you some background. Uh, Jeremiah, my husband, and I have been homesteading on a smaller scale in central Arkansas for the last seven and a half years with our family. There, we purchased a foreclosed house on four acres, which was what we could afford at the time, and we spent a lot of uh, energy, put a lot of sweat equity into it. And over the course of seven and a half years, we did a lot of work on the house, as well as uh, made infrastructure in a place to grow a very large portion of our food. Now, we have had in our hearts for the last few years, we really wanted to move to South Carolina, uh, we just really just felt called to this area we really love it and we spent a long while just kind of taking small steps to get to this point paying off debt uh, working on the property that we had and keeping our eye out for the perfect property we settled on that property in December we found just absolutely a dream piece of land uh, it's 27 acres here in the Midlands of South Carolina, zone eight, gardening zone uh, for those growers out there. And when we were looking for property, uh, we kind of had a list of things we wanted. Now I had my list, which was maybe slightly whimsical. I wanted it to have a pond. I wanted it to have a beautiful epic tree. I wanted rolling hills, good soil, and close enough to church to be able to eat lunch out of the crock pot when I got home. And uh, this property is all of those things. But uh, we also, just from a farm standpoint, there were some things that we wanted. Good soil, we wanted a water source, we wanted uh, to be able to grow good pastures that we could do rotational grazing. And this property met all criteria, both practical and whimsical. Now we found it using a real estate agent and also having our search criteria plugged into like an app. Uh, we had like Zillow and Trulia and all of the real estate apps that notify you when a new property is listed. And this property was on the smaller side of what we were looking for. We were actually looking more for like 40 acres, maybe upwards of 60, uh, because we wanted to have really great pastures, but we also wanted to have a woodlot. Now this particular piece of land does not have a woodlot. With the 27 acres, we will probably in the future try to acquire some more land that we can use to harvest some trees and to use to hunt, but there is a lot of land around here like that. And so we were okay with the main part of our property where our farm would primarily be and our home would primarily be uh, be this because it was so perfect and it was so usable. So we made the deal on this land in December and it did check so many of our boxes and was just such a beautiful piece of land. Uh, we fell in love with it. Maya came out here and looked at it and he called me and said this is it. I think we should jump on it. I gave my blessing and said I trust you. Let's do it. So I actually did not see this land until we'd actually purchased it and he has been out here more than he's been back in Arkansas the last two months, cleaning it up and getting some infrastructure ready. He's been posting videos sharing about that. And today, I just want to kind of give you guys an overview and I'm gonna do my best through an aerial shot and some drone footage to really give you a feel of what we're working with, where we're choosing to place things and why. Now, if you are planning a farm, from scratch, it is typically advised that you get land and you get to know it for a year or so before you do anything permanent on that land. Um, we have now been able to spend some time on this property in winter, spring, and summer. We've not been out here in fall. However, we do have the very unique situation of getting to know our neighbors, which were the original owners of this property, and getting to ask them a lot of questions about the water and about how things work here. And so we're actually jumping in with some kind of 
permanent decisions um, that if we didn't have that information, I might be a little bit more hesitant to make those decisions. Uh, some land when you buy it is going to be like a real mystery to you. Like you don't know how it drains, you don't know where the water pools. Some land when you buy it, you'll be able to ask questions and sometimes you're able to really tell. You're able to see uh, the curvature in the, the ground where you can see where the drainage is and you're kind of able to really gather more information and that's just going to be a case by case basis. So I kind of want to give that disclaimer. I don't suggest that that in all cases that you dive in and start building things especially if you've not had a chance to really scope it out walk the land and be in it in different circumstances and we've been here uh, when Maya came out in the winter to look at it it was raining a lot we've seen it in a lot of different situations and so I feel pretty good about the decisions that we're making at this point and there's always a chance that we are gonna have to redo things that's just that's just a risk in anything that you decide to build now our goal here is to grow food for our family and I will tell you that I don't really consider myself a prepper uh, however I do think that if you gain the knowledge and you practice the skills of growing food that you are going to be way more prepared for situations that might arise that would require that um, and so everything that we do is kind of with the mind of how sustainable is this but also is it causing us to thrive right now? Like I would love to have the skills and the setup that if there was ever a necessity for whatever reason, and there are many reasons that could arise, uh, that I was able to grow food for my family and that we would not need to be dependent on the grocery store. However, in the meantime, I want to enjoy food that I cannot buy at the grocery store. I want to enjoy food that is amazing and wonderful. I'm totally a foodie and so I like to grow things that I can't just go purchase. And so our farm is always going to kind of straddle that line between thriving now but having the confidence of being able to survive in any situation. So I'm standing here in the driveway here. Um, our property is on a corner and our entrance of our driveway is off of a gravel road and you drive in here between two ponds. We have all the fences down right now and you can see we've reset T-posts. There's a small pond here on the right side of the driveway and over here on the left is a really large pond. And right here in the front entrance, there's a pretty good sized section of ground. And the front side of this large pond, we have basically the dam that was built up to hold the pond in. And this whole side is this pretty steep little incline. And my plan up here in this initial space, I'm going to landscape around the entrance, which is shaded. Uh, we've, Maya built this really pretty entrance. And all down here along the side, my current idea is to utilize this space as a... I don't, I don't necessarily want to say food forest because I don't think that this is going to be like a true permaculture food forest, but I am going to go more with perennials. I'm going to be doing some fruit trees down here in this area. This is like a little triangle of space and along this berm here that holds the pond in on that incline, I'm hoping to do a little bit of terracing and establish some fruit trees and some different things down this side to cut down some on the maintenance and the brush because there, it's just right now it's just going to be a constant upkeep to keep that from being super brushy. So if we can cultivate that in things that we want growing there that will uh, choke out weeds then that would be beneficial because then we're getting food and we're also cutting down the amount of work that's required for us. So I'm standing here on the side of the pond looking at this area in front of the entryway and this will be one of the earlier areas that we do things with. I'm going to come in and get some wood chips down and get some of those fruit trees planted up here as soon as possible. And getting a new property, uh, getting the fruit trees planted, ASAP, getting those perennial things in like asparagus, uh, getting the berry bushes in, 
you want to do that soon because the sooner you get those things planted the sooner you get to eat from them a lot of fruit trees take five to seven years if you're starting with small ones to really start producing and so if i can plant those this fall which is a good time to plant them here in south carolina where we'll be um, i'm just that much closer to harvesting from them now right here next to the pond is a mature persimmon tree and it is very very loaded down with fruit and see all of that growing there so that's really nice to have already established and my thought is here to do maybe some terracing or swales on the side of this where it, where it is a little steeper and maybe plant just some rows of fruit trees down along the side now you'll notice behind here this pond is really big uh, this is about four and a half acres of the 27 acres is this pond and this was one of the really big selling points for me for this property because i like to fish um, i've taught my kids to fish raising my kids to like fishing and having this is a ready-made source of entertainment a ready-made source of food and it's water it's good to have water on your property if you're going to be farming uh we could use this to water things on our property to run water to animals to run water to gardens now we have dug a well um which we'll get to that but it, it's good to have water on your property this is stocked has a lot of fish in it uh, we are going to do some management when we get here because it has a lot of really small fish in it and, and we're going to get some advice and educate ourselves and figure out what to do to maximize this as a food source because it would just be really great to be able to come out and catch dinner so definitely love that this is on our property so we're back to the beginning here where we drive in between the two ponds and on the right here you can see we've got these fence posts up around the smaller pond and this is fenced it's a pretty large yard i would say that we have probably fenced in including the pond about two acres here and the immediate plan here in this two acre area with the smaller pond is that we are going to bring the pigs which we currently have into this space as well as our ducks and geese um, right now those animals are all together at our old farm so we know that they coexist okay and I've done some reading about keeping pigs in a pond area and there are, are two different camps it is really suggested in some permaculture camps to do that to keep pigs in ponds areas uh, some people even use pigs to help seal ponds that will put pigs in areas where they have dug ponds and they're trying to seal the uh the bottom of them to keep them the whole water and they'll put pigs in because pigs wallowing will compact the soil and make those ponds hold water this pond does lose some of its depth in the summer like right now it's lower than it was in the winter the big pond is spring fed so it always has water um and this one there it, there's a lot of space that drains down to this pond so i don't think it's ever in any risk of going dry but our initial plan is to go ahead and put our pigs in here now we have more pigs than we intend to keep in the future so we have a few mangalitsas that we're planning on um turning into charcuterie meat we have processed one back in arkansas uh, we need to build a cold smoker to be able to to process all of that meat and so we left a few of those pigs on the hoof and we're just moving them and we're going to process them this winter here so right now we have a few more pigs than we're going to have later but uh, we're getting out of breeding mangalitsas for the time being just because we have several several pigs already and um, keeping up with breeding stock and moving them and all of that stuff was going to kind of be an issue so all of our pigs are going to go into this space for now uh, we are reading about some different ways as far as pasturing those and figuring out exactly how we want to work out our system of raising out pigs but for the time being they're all going to be in this big two acre space which is a large enough space that they're not going to exhaust that and they're going to have access to this water 
and it kind of simplifies things for right now because we can just run one hot wire around this big field and get them in here now pigs don't need much by way of like fancy structure so we'll just put something up for them to be able to stay out of the weather um, in here and eventually my idea is that I would like to have them you know we want to be able to move their structure around we just don't want to overly exhaust any one area on the farm so right past the pond here there's a little section which right now there's this little barn building that was existing whenever we got here and we're currently using this right now um, it's one of the only dry storage places we have so we're very much using it, but our plan is to take this down. Maya is going to repurpose that shipping container here um, over in his sawmill area. And this is going to come down and this section just be cleared. Now, I don't know where it's going to fall in terms of priority. Uh, we definitely have things that are much higher on the list than this. But our eventual plan is where this building is to put in just like an open-sided pavilion with a paved floor um, probably a little bit larger than what this building is but not massive but right up here in the front when we first come in and we have the pond we basically just want to have an area where we can do things like have birthday parties and cookouts it's just an outdoor entertaining space you know we'll probably build in something uh, where you can keep like a grill or something like that i don't really know exactly how that'll work out but essentially we want to make this space a really usable space that we can give access to our friends to like come in and go fishing that we can host things this is such a beautiful little park like area and that is one of the reasons why we don't plan on keeping animals up here i mentioned the permaculture stuff on the front side of the pond to kind of help with the brush I, lot, I know a lot of people go well why wouldn't you keep your goats there um goats are pretty ferocious and as much as i tell them not to eat the flowers i just don't listen so really the best way to keep goats from destroying things is keep them away from them so if i want to have things like land landscaping in the front or fruit trees or anything in this space it's just not super feasible to keep animals in this space so the whole area directly around the pond the big pond we do not plan on keeping animals we plan on keeping animals around the little pond the big pond the selling point for that was really for us more than it was for using it for animals it's just a really nice little body of water and super functional for things like fishing you can you could take a little rowboat out on it it's just really awesome for that and we really want to use this for like people purposes <laughs> so a pavilion right here um, is really what I'm envisioning and I think that's going to add a lot because this is we plan on this being like our forever home uh, we want to build our house here that I plan on having my grandbabies in and so we're thinking long term with this as far as raising our kids hosting friends we have a big family you know having grandchildren and all of that down the road we're thinking long term and so that's why we really want to preserve this space for those purposes and 27 acres is a lot of space so it's not like we're hurting for spaces to grow food. Uh, we do not have to utilize every single bit of this for production. We would have way more than we could possibly use if we did that. So it's completely okay to say, oh, well, this space is not for food growing or animals. This space is really just for our enjoyment. Again, we're doing this to thrive as well as survive. So right past where the pavilion will be, we have these old sawtooth oaks that are really, really beautiful. And our plan is to put up like a fence that kind of goes down alongside the pond here where I can do some landscaping and some different things. And right here on this section next to the pond, my hope is to uh, put in some more fruit trees. So you'll notice right here, there's a big old junk pile. Um, a lot of what you're seeing on that junk pile, those are some big like beet poles and different things that are coated in like creosite and some of that was here there was a bit of a junk pile here from where a barn had been taken down and some of our deconstruction of things has ended up there uh, a lot of the the posts and some different things that we took out has ended up there and that is sitting right where it is because that is actually the placement for our future house and some of that stuff 
when it's burned is going to need to be buried and we did not want to burn that in an area we're going to be where we're going to be gardening growing food or trying to keep animals so uh, putting that where it's going to be underneath the foundation of the house uh, felt like the safest place to dispose of those things here we have the scrap pile and we're just going to have to work around this because it's kind of in the middle of what I want to show you guys. So right here on the other side of the pig yard, I'm going to show you guys this kind of drawn on an aerial photo and I can really understand what it is that I'm explaining. But right here is the gate out of the pig yard. You can see higher in the corner, there's a gate into the pasture back here. And right here along the pig fence is going to be our driveway. It's going to come straight down here. Basically, you'll come past this pig yard. And I am calling this the food belt or the garden belt. But this driveway is going to kind of curve back around what will be our house site. And it will curve back towards the back. And we'll get back there and I'll show you what it will lead to. But there will be a section here between the driveway and the pasture it's about 80 feet deep and it's going to curve along with the driveway and that is going to be where our garden efforts primarily happen on this farm so if you've been with me for very long you have surely heard me talk about my philosophy in gardening which is that we should grow something lovely i firmly believe that a garden that woos your heart uh, will get much more of your love and attention and affection than one that is grown purely for utility purposes. So it was very important to me when designing this farm, again, to thrive as well as survive, that I wanted to grow our food as naturally and sustainably as possible, that I wanted to grow things that were interesting, and that I also wanted to create you know the space that i want to live that i want to raise my family that i that i love that i love being in um it's just something that is really important to my heart and when lining all of this out and in lining this main space we're going to build our home um the line of this and kind of the artistic expression of this was important to me. So I actually chewed on it for a really long time. I spent a few months really studying the overhead. We made the trips out here. You know, we spent a solid week out here in April just hanging out on this property all day, every day, really becoming acquainted with it and understanding it more. And I had a really hard time figuring out how I wanted to do this and when I finally settled on it, it was like a light bulb moment and I love it. Now from the aerial, you'll notice that my food belt, my garden belt that runs along my driveway is really kind of smack dab in the middle of the property that is 100% intentional. There are a lot of uh, timberland around here, a lot of trees and that means there's a lot of wildlife. I have found that if you can place your garden as close to your home as possible and within kind of a barrier where there are other animals kept around where the garden is, you deal with less deer. Um, we've already seen a lot of deer on this property. They're clear cutting some lots pretty close to here, pushing that deer population out. And I have no doubt that that's something that we're going to have to deal with here. But I do feel like by having the garden here centrally located in the middle of the farm, uh, we're giving it its best chance for survival. Because what I found is, is that deer don't really like to go through a yard with pigs. They don't really like to go through a yard with goats necessarily. Sometimes they will. I'm definitely not saying that's a rule. But I felt like it had a better chance here than if we backed it right up to the woods. So right past the pig yard right where the driveway comes in we are going to be erecting two high tunnels very similar to the ones that we had in Arkansas uh, they're 60 feet deep and they will fit right in here we measured this with these high tunnels in mind and you can see that we've got the fence line going right back there so the benefit of high tunnels in an area like this in South Carolina obviously it's warm here uh, much of the time but you can put shade cloth on them which the issue in a place like this is less so much extending the winters and more 
extending into your summer where it's very hot, where the sun is really intense, being able to grow a shade cloth kind of helps mellow the garden out in the, the summer. So one of these high tunnels is gonna be for that. We'll grow through the winter, we'll grow cold hardy things, and we probably will never heat that. It's not ever gonna be necessary. But if we do have like an unusually cold winter, like we had this last winter, um, we'll have that. We'll have the indoor space. We can leave the sides open if it doesn't need to be closed up, but we'll have the option of closing it up. And then we can grow with the shade cloth during the summer and be able to produce some food. Now in that first high tunnel, it will be the one closest to the pig yard. We'll be building a chute that goes from the pig yard into that high tunnel so we can utilize the pigs to till the ground up. Uh, we're gonna be practicing some different deep litter methods, running some chickens in there in the off season and basically partnering with our animals to make that high tunnel as as great as it can be there will not be any sort of beds or barriers in that it's going to be directly in the ground and we're going to work on building soil in that and the second high tunnel it's going to be for things like citrus. Being zone eight, we can grow a good deal of citrus here however if there is like a really intense freeze it could knock it out. I mean, we're just barely within the range of, of places that can grow that stuff. So again, by planting it in a tunnel and irrigating it, we have the option to protect it if temperatures get colder than usual. And if we're gonna make the investment in putting citrus in, I just think that that would be a really good thing to do. And we don't have to give the entire tunnel to citrus. We can just have the citrus trees established in there and then develop some other beds or areas in there that we could grow annual things. Right past the two tunnels in my garden belt, I'm going to establish some rows of dwarf fruit trees, varieties that get eight to 10 feet tall. So they will not cause a lot of conflict with those tunnels. It might cast a little bit of shade during certain parts of the day, but it's not gonna be a major issue. Um, and those are going to be in these rows in this 80 foot wide garden belt. And I'll do things like an entire row of dwarf apples, and then the proper spacing, an entire row of dwarf pears. And I'll probably give, be giving a pretty good set section of this garden belt to things like that. And where I've mentioned having fruit trees in the other places, that's where I will put full-size trees. P specifically apples and peaches and plums and pears. I'd like to get some fig trees going up at the front. Figs are actually my most favorite food in the entire world. I could live on them, <laughs> but it's probably better that I don't. Uh, but yeah, so over here is going to be dwarf fruit trees as well as rows of berry bushes so like an entire row of blueberries probably go with a couple different varieties maybe even a couple of rows as well as blackberries and raspberries and that's going to account for a pretty good section here past the high tunnels this is a massive space when i talk about this garden belt you got to think it's like 80 feet wide and then like several i don't know what 600 feet or something i haven't measured it exactly yet but it's a there's a lot of space. So the, there's gonna be basically this orchard with dwarf trees all through here. And then we're going to come into some in-ground garden spaces. And a pretty significant part of this garden belt is going to be in-ground spaces that we're going to develop with wood chips and no-dig gardening methods. We're gonna do wood chips in the orchard area as well. And I'm planning on leaving enough space to do lots of sweet potatoes, potatoes, rows of things like corn, basically commodity type growing things, onions, garlic. Most of that stuff is going to be grown in the ground in no dig spaces, which we will get established. Now I'm going to break from the garden belt and come over here and discuss this pasture. Oh, Maya's taking the drone up to get some footage for this video. So here you'll notice sweet Maya flying the drone as well as this barn which was here in pretty rough shape and this is one of the things that Maya and all of our helpers have come out and given a facelift to. On the other side of this barn is the big pasture and including the side yard which we have fenced in along with it uh, the big pasture in the side yard is roughly 
about 13 or 14 acres. So it's a really large pasture. And right now this barn is gonna be within that fence line. Now our current plan is to do a sturdy perimeter fence. And we have currently taken down all the old fence. We've salvaged what T posts we can from everything that was used here. Probably we'll use most of those for gardening. And we have set new T posts <laughs> and we are putting up perimeter fence. It's one of the most expensive parts of what we're establishing right now. But we are really big believers in good fences. In fact, this is one of the things that drove me the most crazy whenever we were getting established in our old farm because Jeremiah was insistent that we not get the animals that I wanted to get until we could afford to put in proper fencing. And it made me so frustrated at the time but I have since learned in associating with so many friends that do homesteading um, in the areas where I was just insistent that we cut corners and we put up um, makeshift fences, the headache that is involved with makeshift fences, it is avoidable by good fences and I would rather wait and be patient and start on a smaller scale with better fences than try to just make something up because I think a lot of people take the route of pushing through uh, just to be able to do something and they end up giving up and they end up not keeping animals at all. They give up on homesteading because they're like, oh, that was a nightmare. I can't tell you how many people have told me how much they hate goats, how they will never have goats again, how they just, they're so not worth the trouble, all of that stuff. And so many people told me, well, you can't keep them in a fence. And to be completely frank, we have never had a problem with our goats getting out. Uh, we've had, in six years of keeping goats, we've had a couple of issues. Uh, usually it's because kids left the gate open um, or the fences were beginning to fail because they were worn. And so this was one area that was really, really important to us to prioritize is putting up a decent fence. Now we are fencing a really large area here. There are areas of our property that we are waiting to get to as far as fencing because to do it all at once was just gonna be way too expensive. So we started with this front pasture and the pig yard and the eventual plan is to fence the rest of the property. And for now, we're going to be using electric fencing to do rotational grazing. That way, we're not married to every fence line, but our perimeter fence is solid. So if my goats get out, the worst that could happen is maybe like an accidental breeding, but this will greatly lessen. I'm not gonna say never because, um, Animals are persistent and things do happen, but this will greatly lessen the calls I get from the neighbor that says, hey, your buck is in my garden. We want good perimeter fences. We don't want our animals in the road. We don't want them being a nuisance to anybody. So we put up good perimeter fencing and that's been a priority. And right now we are using this barn. It's basically just a stay dry shelter. You can see it's just a, it's just a shelter um, that'll keep our goats and our alpacas out of the weather. And right now, as soon as we get here, all of our animals are gonna be out in this pasture. All the goats and alpacas will just be out here together and we'll get to the rotational grazing and all of that stuff. But for right now, it's the middle of the summer. There's a ton of grass. We don't have that many animals. This pasture will keep them busy and they will not be over exhausting any one area. So where I'm standing now, is in what will eventually be the garden belt. You can see here is our well house, which we just had this well dug. It's a 200 foot well and is uh, flowing at 25 gallons a minute, which is really good. Everyone in this area tells me that this particular region um, when you drill into the wells, they're all rock encased, so the water is really clean. We are going to do whatever we need to do filtration-wise to make sure that's the case. But we feel really hopeful that this is going to be good. And over here, you'll be able to see on the aerial view that this pasture where the goat fence is kind of comes back and is behind the garden belt. And this is a pretty large section here. Now right here is going to be a gate, which will have a drive that goes right up here and cuts and cuts through the garden belt out there to the driveway in the clearing where our house will be. And my plan is on either side of this drive to make what I'm calling my eclectic garden. So we'll have the orchard, the perennial plants, 
all of the in-ground spaces obviously a lot of that is me focusing on production the high tunnels but here on either side of this drive that cuts back into this yard where the goats are I'm planning on doing basically a garden that is a, just my expression of joy for gardening and I have a lot of ideas for that that I've been gathering over the years um, and it'll be a mix of raised beds and annuals and perennials and flowers and basically it's going to be just a really beautiful garden space it is going to be that I do I'll grow a lot of food in it I'm planning on doing a lot more cut flowers on this property but um I do envision this big space. I'm thinking of growing some something that's going to kind of arch over this pathway into the the barn area. Um, I can see it. It'll probably take. We'll, we'll break ground on it this spring. I don't expect that this garden belt space is going to be really in its full glory for probably another four or five years. Um, we'll put everything in, but all those orchard plants, because I'm going to need so many of them, I'll probably go with really small plants. Um, it will be cheaper. And uh, we're going to start wood chipping some different areas, building soil, doing all that stuff. And it'll take some time, but four or five years from now, Y'all are gonna see, it will have been worth the wait. So you'll go through this path from the driveway into this gate, and this is the yard that's kind of an extension of the big pasture. This is a really big space. Section back here, I would say, is probably slightly small. I don't know, it's a few acres. Probably slightly smaller than our whole farm now. But right back there, you can kind of see some orange stakes right here. And that is where our barn is going. And that barn will be where we house goats where we milk where we um have you know birth and all of that stuff where we'll do you know store feed and um it's gonna be red it's gonna be a red barn i've dreamed of having a red barn since i was a little girl and so i'm i'm wanting it to be this like experience like i'm, I'm imagining this space this whole space being extremely functional it's gonna feed us it's gonna feed our family in a really big way you can grow so much food in the space that we're talking about but i'm also wanting it to be very romantic very intentional and so with things like the path through the eclectic garden to the barn and like plants you know trees arching over um I just imagine it being beautiful. And so the red barn was one of those details for me that was really important. And that's also where my cow is gonna live. That is on the short list for us. Um, I don't know how soon. I have had multiple people message me about cows that they had for sale or they knew of for sale. We're not ready for it yet. We don't have the barn yet. And I definitely wanna get it when it's not gonna be a headache. But um, we also have a lot of grass here, so having a cow that we could rotate would definitely help with that. So there's benefit to getting one soonish, but I also don't want to rush. That's the drone you're hearing, by the way. So right past this section of eclectic garden in the garden belt, down here towards the end of this little uh, section of the pasture, it kind of slopes down here. I don't know if you can really see that but that is where a lot of the water from the property behind ours and ours drains down to the big pond there's like a swell here that you can kind of tell where the water goes so we don't want to build anything like right there in that section so the garden belt's going to end um right before that swell dips down where the ground is still level and right here on the end of the garden belt is where we will build the window greenhouse 2.0 essentially going to be a seed starting greenhouse of course we'll have the high tunnels but the window greenhouse right here at the end of the garden belt uh probably facing inward towards the rest of the garden and i will be surrounding that with perennials flowers kind of very similar to what we did in arkansas except for this time we probably will not be doing raised beds uh, there we did the cottage garden with the rock that was harvested from that property and this property doesn't have a ton of rock and so i'm not gonna buy that and bring it in so we'll probably build up the bed somehow and grow those things in the ground but i'm not 100 percent sure that's still fairly like in you know kind of in process um we will i think we'll be putting that window greenhouse up 
we might be putting that up this winter. I don't know yet. Truly, like, some of that stuff, we're just kind of having to figure out as we go. Uh, it really just depends on materials and our time, uh, when my dad's gonna be out here. I don't know exactly yet when we're going to break ground on our forever home. Um, so I don't know exactly what all that's gonna look like. I know the barn is gonna be fairly soon. We should be getting that up pretty soon. Uh, as far as all the gardens, we're gonna work on it. But like I said, it's gonna be process. This is our plan that we're working towards. Like you kind of need to know where you're gonna put things from the beginning. You need a loose plan, but you also need to be flexible because things can change. When people drive in, they'll drive alongside the gardens, which would be really nice. Um, now I'm back here behind this tree line in the back corner. I'll highlight that from the aerial view. So our house will be sitting right up here on this high spot next to the pond. Eventually I plan on doing like a really pretty ornamental rose garden kind of to the right of the house where there will be a porch you can sit out and look over the pond. It'll be really nice. That's going to be obviously a few years down the road. Now that whole other side we have a neighbor that's in a small section that's cut out. Currently we're not putting a lot of plans up. Uh, that is because my dad is planning on building a retirement home right there on that little section across the pond in that corner which I'm not gonna walk over there right now I don't have enough light to do that we have two really big barns that were part of this property and they're just like hay storage equipment barns they need some work that area is pretty grown up but it's a perfect equipment yard it's a perfect place to like store materials and keep them out of the way and then we've got like a handful of acres back there that's very usable and will be great in the future if we ever want to do any sort of like rotational grazing if we wanted to plant some more different trees but as of right now this is enough like the 20 acres that we're really developing now uh, which includes the pond is plenty to keep us busy so we're not even really touching that section yet but back here behind this line of oaks past the barnyard uh, you can see we've got some stakes here it's starting to get dark and this is a 50 by 100 foot section which is going to be a really big workshop that will have an office space in it so 50 by 120 feet of that will be just a you know finished out area that is going to be an office like a home office where we can keep things that we sell on our online business like sticker shop stuff just a workspace and in the shop is going to be Jeremiah's little space it's not little it's big but he builds furniture he builds all these different things it'll give him an indoor place where he can pull in a tractor to work on to keep tools woodworking all of that stuff uh, and so that is another thing that's definitely a dream for him and we've got this space filled out right behind that is where the septic is going to go for these buildings and then back here in the corner is where you can see that the footing has been begun to be dug. Uh, this will be poured here in the next couple of days. And this is where our double wide mobile home that we purchased to live in now is going right back here in the very far corner of the property. And we're gonna fence a, a yard in back behind it for our dogs. And this is where we are going to live now. And my very immediate plan when we come back um, next time when we come to stay this will be set up here uh, they just moved it up here when we bought the mobile home uh, we kind of had we didn't have a lot of options just because of supply issues that have been going on as and we bought a nicer double wide like a modular home we are putting it on a permanent foundation we're putting it in this place out of the way so that we can leave it here long term so we're gonna live in it and the benefit of that is, is that we have a ready-made house. We don't have to work on our house. We don't have to put all our energy into fixing our living situation. We can focus fully on farm infrastructure now, this winter. Right away, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of landscaping around that house. 
I'm going to be building a small garden in the front using my green stalk tower planters and I'm gonna be building a small garden in the front using my green stalk tower planters and a couple of uh, Vigo raised garden beds just kind of some ready-made planting things and I'm gonna just go ahead and plant some food so we can have some food soon and my eventual plan for the the double wide is that that's going to be like a guest house because of our plans and what we want to do and what we want to build we expect we're, we're always going to have people coming to stay with us or we're always going to have family we have a really big family and we have six kids so um, as years go by guest space is never going to go amiss but we did purposefully choose this very far back corner behind this tree line uh, because we didn't really want this house to necessarily be a focal point of the property um, it's just something that's serving the purpose for right now and will be very useful to have in the future so the driveway that I showed you guys that where it comes in on the the side road and the main entrance and it's going to curve down past the gardens and then come down around this tree line in front of the shop it's just going to be a gravel driveway um, and then it's going to end in a parking pad that's right here between the workshop and the mobile home our barn with the smaller barnyard which will eventually kind of be closed off from the big pasture right now it's all going to be together will be an area central so that if we ever you know if we have baby animals if we have things that we're nursing we can kind of keep it close central the gardens will be central where they'll be protected and eventually our house will be right in the middle of that now our plan on this property as it stands we're gonna continue to raise hogs. I'm thinking for the time being that we're really gonna focus on um, heritage breeds like an old spot. We still have multiple mangalitsas. We are getting rid of our boar. We're not gonna be bringing a boar, but we are bringing two of our mangalitsas bred and we have quite a few currently on hoof. And we are gonna be building some of the structures we're gonna be building. We haven't nailed down exactly where they'll be, but with the base of this infrastructure lined out, we can work around that. But uh, we are gonna be building a smokehouse so we can smoke our own meats. Um, as far as a root cellar, I'm not 100% sure what we're gonna do on that. Um, we could build something like that. I just don't know. I need to do some more research on that. I need to talk to some more local people. I'm just not sure what the best thing to do is because I just, I just don't know. I'm not educated enough on that to really solidly plan it. But like food storage like that is definitely something to take into consideration. And the house plan, that we designed there is a really large section for food storage to be able to build like a walk-in cooler and stuff like that so obviously we're gonna you know keep that in mind but i just don't know yet we definitely want to have dairy cows here and we will probably raise you know a couple head of beef cows really just because we have so much grass and like rotating those i think would be very doable i think it would help us with management but i don't think we're really going to get into like breeding or keeping a lot of cattle here maybe just a couple and i don't really know about horses horses is something that jeremiah really really loves but i'm not 100 percent sure what our plan is here as far as a horse is concerned <laughs> you're so silly did you get some good drone shots yeah, they're gonna love it. I think that I've conveyed our plan pretty well. Well, I got you lots of aerial shots, so you'll be able to draw it all out, like where the house, the shop, yeah. all the garden spots, the pig area. That's really all there is to show right now. Yeah. Well, I was talking about the plan, too. What do you mean? I mean, to like, obviously get lots of sheep and okay, I'm all of that. <laughs> We're not getting sheep here. I like sheep but that's just not on our radar maybe sometime right now we're really going to go pretty slow as far as animal expansion goes no you're fine now as for right now we're really going to try to go pretty slow as far as animal expansion goes i know some of you now are like laughing and like bookmarking this video so you can show it to me later but truly we we do want to get into dairy cows pretty soon that's something that we really want to do but i really want to take it slow 
because I don't want to get overtaxed on this property. I want to make sure that we manage this well, we build soil well, and that we manage our pastures well. Um, and we already have, you know, we have our goat herd and we have our few alpacas and, and our pigs and our birds. Oh, that's one thing that I will address. You might have noticed that I did not tell you where the chicken coop was going to be. That is because we plan on doing all of our birds on this farm rotated. We do not plan on building any sort of static structures to keep any birds. We will raise turkeys here, we will raise chickens, both meat chickens, and we will keep laying hens. But since we built the chick shaw from Justin Rhodes' plan and started using electric nettings for our chickens, we have much preferred that. It is way easier and we spend like no time having to muck out a chicken coop. So we use those, we'll probably keep those up here in the central area, using those initially rotating them to help establish garden spaces, but eventually we'll probably rotate them a lot around the yards, around our house, the shop, and up in the front by the pavilion and the pond, just because keeping those chickens on that inside area also beyond where all the other animals, the larger animals are that can kind of hold their own out on the perimeter, uh, we can just keep them safer up by the house. And I've found that keeping the birds in an electric net, um, it obviously keeps them in, but it helps keep other things out. So all of our, ch our, our poultry will be pastured here. And with the grass being as healthy as it is, um, that's gonna be something then it's totally doable it just comes down to moving them every couple of days and then you get those rich eggs and all of that so that's really exciting so it's almost completely dark out here i know my camera kind of makes up for that some here you can see what it actually looks like right now so that's the plan subject to change um definitely and right now it's just going to be get the fences up, get out here, start living out here, and start chipping away at these things um, a little at a time. I have said this so many times and I will continue to do so. When you're building a farm, when you're building a homestead, it is so much better to operate with a five-year plan instead of a one-year plan. It's very, very easy to get into this mindset of everything that you want to do. Um, and there are some things that I know we will do, like we'll get back into bees. We'll set up an area for an apiary, but it's just not something that we're immediately thinking about. It's on the five-year plan. It's not on like the next steps plan. There are a lot of things that I know that we're gonna do. Like I said, horses may be somewhere down the road. Sheep could be somewhere down the road. These things could be there, but it's just best to kind of like spread it out and know that you don't have to build it in a day. You don't have to build it in a year. Again, when you set your goal to thriving rather than necessarily surviving, um, you can rest assured that if ever needed, you'll have the survival skills. But in the meantime, getting into a place of like frenzy, trying to build up something to survive on right now, a lot of times what you do is kind of dig yourself into a hole and you get to a point where you're not thriving. So we want to do both. We want to have a healthy infrastructure and a productive farm, and we want to have a rich and full and fruitful life in the meantime. So there's our plan. We're so excited to take you guys along on that journey and show you uh, every step of the way. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I bless you. Until next time.